of our praises, our prayer requests. So Bruce and Shelly and Michelle, your mom. Uh, I'm not sure if I prayed for that or not. So why don't we do that right now? Father, thank you. Thank you for the ability to touch base with relatives and to reach out and to, to see and feel and hear. And we praise you for that. Thank you for Bruce and Shelley in 39 years and the example that that is to us. Father, I ask you now to open our minds and open our hearts that we can see and hear and understand the truth of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, um, I want to get started with some scripture today, but I also just want to talk to you a little bit about the message. We entitled it Love and Justice. And, and it seems like two pretty simple things, two pretty, pretty basic concepts when we're talking to church folks. Hear it out. Listen, understand, maybe we remember some things we need to share with others that have to do with love and justice. Romans chapter 3, verses 21 to 25 says, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith, in Jesus the Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. Let me start out with a question. Anybody ever have their car insurance canceled? Come on, raise your hand if you... No one! That's a hard thing to raise your hand, so I'm going to... It's something you don't like to admit. Well, let me tell you, it happened to me one time in my life. I didn't drop them. They dropped me. Kicked me right on out. It wasn't because I didn't pay the premium. I was on time with premiums, all caught up. Here's why they dropped me. They dropped me for making too many mistakes. Yeah, I had a family policy, a wife, two kids, 16 you know, years old or so, driving. Two fender benders, couple hit deer, couple speeding violations. Now, I'm the first to admit that I tend to have a bit of a heavy foot. When you combine the two, the heavy foot and hit the deer, that doesn't go so well. None of the fender benders were our fault. At least that's our side of the story. But we're certainly not perfect drivers. But here's my argument. Isn't that the reason that we have insurance? I mean, aren't the blemishes on my record an indication that I'm worthy of their insurance? <laughs> really? Wasn't the whole insurance business invented for people like me and my family? And doesn't fender benders keep them in business? Think of it this way. If not for all of my blunders, what would the actuaries actuate? They should be congratulating me as a good customer. Instead, here's what they did. They, they documented our whole driving history. Sort of look back at our secrets from the past. Yeah, apparently somebody was counting. And they knew exactly what our record was costing them. I, I wonder, didn't they realize 1 Corinthians that said, love keeps no record of wrongs? I, I think they could use a little instruction there. 
and we tried to follow all the rules. We reported the fender benders. We reported hitting the deer. I'm thinking that maybe they don't really understand 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Don't we get some credit for being honest? Apparently not in the insurance industry. Brian, where do you work? Seltzer. <laughs> oh, okay. Apparently you need to take that message to Seltzer, right? So let me get this right. I bought insurance to cover my mistakes, but then they dropped me for making mistakes. <laughs> Am I missing something here? Was there a paragraph in there that read, uh, we will provide you insurance until you show yourself to be somebody who needs it, and then your insurance ceases? I didn't read all that in the fine print. I have a real good friend named Bob Manley. He's been an insurance broker most of his life. He uh, covered several businesses that I was involved in. Bob told me, when you get an insurance document, the first page of the insurance binder has all the things that they cover on the first page. The other 50 pages tell why they don't. <laughs> so you could miss some things in the fine print. But let me ask you this. Isn't the insurance dropping me like a doctor treating only healthy patients? Or is it like a dentist that doesn't treat patients who have as cavities? Here's another one. Maybe qualifying for a loan by proving that you don't really need it. What if the fire department said it would protect you until you had a fire and then no more? Or what if a lifeguard protected you until you start to drown? Now, now we don't do drowning. We do watching of drowning. We'll watch you, but not drown. And so the crazy question is, is what if heaven worked that way? What if you got a letter from heaven that read like that? I'm writing in response to today's request for forgiveness. I'm sorry to inform you that you have reached your quota of sins. Mm -hmm. Our records show that since employing our services, you have erred seven times in the area of greed. Your prayer life is substandard compared to people of like age and circumstance. Further review reveals that your understanding of doctrine is in the lower 20 percentile. You has, have excessive tendencies to gossip. Because of your sins, you're a high-risk candidate for heaven. You need to understand that grace has its limits. Jesus sends his regrets and kindness regards and hopes that you will find some other coverage. <laughs> what if we got a letter like that? Because I think some of us worry we already have. If an insurance company can't cover my honest mistakes, can I expect God to cover my intentional rebellion? The Apostle Paul was a pretty cool guy. He answers some of our questions in the book of Romans. In Romans chapter four and verses one to five, the apostle Paul talks about our works. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? And he's talking about our works. If in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. Then he asks, what does scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited, credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God, listen to this, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. 
wow, what an incredible claim. It's one thing to make good people right, but what about the ungodly? He justifies the ungodly? Evil? We can expect that God will justify decent people, but what about dirty folks? Surely coverage is provided for the driver with the clean record. What about the speeder? What about those with tickets? What about those at high risk? How in the world can justification come for the evil, for the ungodly? It can't in this world. It's got to come from heaven. Man has no way but God has a way. Up until this point in Paul's letter, all efforts at salvation had been talking about from earth upward. Man has sort of inflated his balloon with his own hot air and still not been able to leave this atmosphere. You know, our pleas of ignorance are inexcusable, Romans 1.20. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. We can make our comparisons to others, but they're not very pertinent. Romans 2.1, you therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same stuff. It says in Romans chapter 2, verse 29, that even our religious merits are unacceptable. It says, no, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. Folks, I think when we look at it, the conclusion is completely unavoidable that we can't save ourselves. We have friends. We have family. We can't save them either. But we can show them the one who can. Man has no way to save himself. The Apostle Paul announces that God has a way. See, where man fails, God excels. Salvation comes from heaven downward, not earth upward. There's nothing we can do down here on earth to save ourselves. Luke 178 says this, Because of the tender mercy of God, the rising sun will come to us from heaven. It comes to us. And James 1.17 says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights. We talked about that scripture last week. Please note that salvation is God-given. Salvation is God-driven. And God-empowered and God-originated. The gift is not from man to God. The gift is from God to man. It's not our love for God, it's God's love for us in sending his son to be the way to take away our sins. 1 John 4.10 says it this way. It says, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Amen. Isaiah 45a teaches us, You heavens above rain down my righteousness. Let the clouds shower it down. Let the earth open wide. Let salvation spring up. Let righteousness flourish with it. I, the Lord, have created it. I think on the basis of this point alone, Christianity is set apart from any other religion in the world. 
No other system or ideology or religion proclaims free forgiveness and a new life to those who have done nothing to deserve it, but deserve judgment instead. Every other approach out there to God is sort of like a bartering system. If I do this, God will do that. If I do this on Sunday, God will do this. If I do this. Either approach to God is a bartering system. I'm either saved by works, the stuff that I do. I'm saved by emotions, what I experience or feel. Or I'm saved by my knowledge, what I know. But folks, by contrast, Christianity has no hint of negotiation at all. Man's not the negotiator. Indeed, man has no grounds to negotiate. I think those who are closest to God have understood this. Those nearest to him have never boasted about their deeds. In fact, they were kind of disgusted by the thought of self-salvation and they describe legalism in repulsive terms. The prophet Isaiah in 64, 6 said this about our righteous acts. He said, all of us have become like one who is unclean and all of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Let me put that in real clear perspective. He's talking about a woman's cycle, unclean, filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. That's what our righteous acts are like. And the Apostle Paul equated our religious credentials to garbage. Philippians 3, 6. What is more, I, Paul, consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. The word translated garbage there is something you would find uh, out in a cow pasture. It's manure. He considers everything manure compared to knowing Christ. You know, you can summarize the first three and a half chapters of the book of Romans with just three words. The words are, we have failed. We have failed. We've attempted to reach the moon and we've scarcely made it off the ground. We don't need more stuff. We need a savior. Friends, it is so vital that we embrace this truth God's highest concern is not to make us rich, not to make us successful or popular or famous. God's concern is to make us right with him. And how does God make us right with him? Let's think back to my insurance company and ask a few questions. First, let me ask, was it unjust in dismissing me as a client? Nope. I may find it disheartening, but I can't call it unfair. They only did what they said they would do. And so did our father. He told Adam in Genesis 2.17, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. No fine print there. No hidden agenda, no loophole. God's been fair. Since Eden, the wages of sin have been death. That's what it tells us in Romans 6.23. Just as reckless driving has consequences, well, so does reckless living. Just as I have no defense before the insurance company, I have less defense before God. My record accuses me. My past convicts me. But check this out. So, suppose this. Suppose the CEO of the insurance company chose to have mercy on me. 
Suppose for some reason he wanted to keep me as a client. What can he do? Can he just close his eyes and pretend I made no mistakes? Why doesn't he take my driving record and just tear it up? I think for two reasons. First, the integrity of the company would be compromised if he relaxed this, his standards. And secondly, the mistakes of the driver would be encouraged. If there's no price for my mistakes, why should I drive carefully? If the CEO will dismiss my errors, then what's to keep me from driving however I want? Instead of 55, I'll hit that deer at 65 or 70. If he's willing to ignore my blunders, then why not blunder on? Is that the aim of the CEO? Is that the goal of his mercy? That we lower the standards and we have poor driving? Nope. So the CEO is faced with a dilemma. How can I be merciful and fair at the same time? How can I offer grace without endorsing mistakes? Or to put it in biblical terms, how can God punish the sin and love the sinner? I think Paul made it clear in Romans 1.18. He says the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Is God going to lower his standard so he can be so we can be forgiven? Is, is God going to look away and pretend that we never sin? Would we want a God who did that? Who changed the rules? Who made exceptions? Probably not. We want a God who does not change, who judges all people in the same way. Besides, to ignore my sin would be to endorse my sin. If my sin has no price, then sin on. If my sin brings no pain, then sin on. My friends, is this the aim of God, to compromise his holiness and enable our evil? The answer is, of course not. Well, then what's he to do? How can he be just and love the sinner? How can he be loving and punish the sin? How can he satisfy his standard and forgive my mistakes? Is there any way God can honor the integrity of heaven without turning his back on me? Because I'm a screw up. I goof up. Mercy compels the sinner to be loved. Holiness demands the sinner to be punished. How can God do both? Let's check back with the insurance CEO. Imagine he invites me to his office and he says these words. He says, sir, I found a way to deal with your mistakes. I can overlook them. I can't overlook them because that would be unjust. I can't pretend you didn't commit them because that would be a lie. But here's what I can do. I checked over our records and I found a person with a spotless past who never broke a law. Not one violation, not even a fender bender, not one trespass, not even a parking ticket. And he has volunteered to trade records with you. Yeah, we'll take your name and put it on his record and, and we'll take his name and we'll put it on yours. And, and we'll punish him for what you did. And, you who did wrong will be right, and he who did right will be wrong. What? Are you kidding me? Who would do this for me? Who is that person? And to which the CEO answers, well, it, it's me. Now here's the thing. If you're waiting for an insurance executive to say that, don't hold your breath, because he probably won't. In fact, he can't. Even if he wanted to, he couldn't. 
because he has no perfect record. But if you're waiting to hear God say those words, you can breathe a sigh of relief because he has. And he can. <coughs> Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. I, I think that part means that we're supposed to tell people that. Here's verse 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The perfect record of Jesus is given to you and to me. And our imperfect record, he gets that. Hung it on a tree for everybody to see. Jesus was not guilty, but he suffered for those who are guilty to bring you to God. Can we say that to people? First Peter 3.18 says it this way. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. And as a result, God's holiness is honored and his children are forgiven. By his perfect life, Jesus fulfilled the commands of the law. By his death, he satisfied the demands of sin. Jesus suffered not like a sinner. Jesus suffered as a sinner. Why else would he cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Can I ask you to think about our God? He doesn't condone our sin, nor does he compromise his standard. He doesn't ignore our rebellion, nor does he relax his demands. Rather than dismiss our sin, he assumes our sin. And incredibly, he sentences himself. God's holiness is honored, our sin is punished, and we are redeemed. And oh, our God is still a wonderful God. And the wages of sin is still death. And we're made perfect. Perfect. That's a pretty cool word. Hebrews 10, 14 says... For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. God justifies, he makes perfect. Then he sanctifies, he makes holy. God does what we can't do. He does what we can't even dream of doing. To be perfect before God. And what did he do with our poor driving record? He canceled the debt, which listed all the rules we failed to follow. He took away that record with its rules and he nailed it to a Roman tree. Colossians 2.14, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away nailing it to a cross. And what should be our response? Let's go one more time to the insurance agent, to the CEO. I return to my agent and I ask him, call up the file. He does and he stares at the computer in disbelief because there's nothing there. My past is perfect, spotless. 
my response. If I'm dishonest and I'm ungrateful, I'll probably deepen my voice a little bit, cross my arms and say, yeah, you're right, I am perfect, right? It's not easy to have such a great driving record as I have. Nothing on that screen, right? But if I'm honest and if I'm grateful, I'll simply smile and say, sir, I really don't deserve that compliment. In fact, I don't deserve that record. It is and was a wonderful gift of grace. So for me, I had to get a new insurance carrier, a little higher rates. Who knows, I may have a few more bumps along the way. But eternally, my soul has heavenly coverage. And Jesus won't dismiss clients. I think he's known, however, for paying some for paying some premiums. And we get to be paid up for life. See, I'm in good hands with all... No more insurance talk. See, I'm in perfect hands with Jesus the Christ. think you are too. And I think there's some folks out that need to know that. That they can be too.